Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Khan. I'm a member of the National Board of Wine Communicators of Australia, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this WCA webinar, the first for 2014 in the consumer perception stream we're running in partnership with the GWRDC, the Grape and Wine Research and Development Corporation. Today, we are revisiting China, and again, our guide is Dr. Amanda Corsi from the University of South Australia. As many of you are aware, because you joined us, Amanda ran a webinar for us late last year in which he reported some initial findings from two of his projects in China. Both have moved on quite some way and there is some new stuff to report. So I'm sure there will be something of interest to everybody in today's presentation. There are a few hotter topics in the wine game than China. A reminder of course that this is a webinar and you can get involved by asking a question or simply making a comment. As you'll see from the screen, there are three options for doing that. Use the comment box on the bottom left of your screen. Use Twitter or just send us an email. Of course, if you use the comment box, as most people tend to do, other participants at the webinar will be able to read your thoughts and join the conversation as well. WCA's program manager, Jen Barwick, is with Armando and me here in our secluded corner of the National Wine Centre in Adelaide. She'll be monitoring all the comments and feeding questions through to us. And any we don't get to, we will follow up after the webinar. And there will also be uh, two or three pop-up surveys during the presentation, so please take the time to give us your thoughts. Today's webinar is free, courtesy of the GWRDC. Our Consumer Perceptions webinar series is part of the Corporation's Extension activity around its Consumers and Markets program. This program is designed to help businesses and organisations better understand how consumer purchasing decisions are made and why. Which leads me to today. A brief introduction for those uh, who were with us last time. Armando is a Senior Research Associate at the Ehrenberg Bath Institute for Marketing Science and a Senior Lecturer in the School of Marketing here at the University of South Australia. He holds a PhD in Wine Economics and Rural Development from the University of Florence and his great interest is wine and other premium and luxury products. Half his luck. In particular, his research focuses on consumer behaviour, behavioural loyalty and packaging. Over the past three years, he's been involved with, I think, five different projects funded through the DWRDC, and three are related to China. He's also a regular contributor to a number of academic and wine trade, wine trade journals, and is a member of the editorial committee of the Wine and Viticulture Journal here in Australia, and the scientific committee of the International Journal of Wine, Economics and Policy. So, Armando, over to you, Consumer Perceptions, what's new from China? Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thank you very much to the Wine Communicators of Australia for inviting me again. And also thanks to the GWRDC, as I say, without which this research would not be possible. Um, first of all, for those who don't know me, uh, Nick had a very good introduction on myself, isn't probably too much. Uh, where I'm from is the Edinburgh Bus Institute for Marketing Science. We are part of the University of South Australia, and we are one of the biggest research uh, centers for marketing in the country. Um, the fact that we are part of the university, uh, but at the same time that we work with clients, as you can see in this slide, guarantees two things at the same time. One, that we conduct our research with the highest uh, possible standard of academic rigor, but at the same time that we don't live in an ivory tower. Uh, we try to make research that is applicable, that is work for the companies that work for us. Um, for those who were not here last time, I just would like to have a brief overview of the research project that we are currently conducting with the uh, GWRDC. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about, in particular, all, about two of them, the China Wine Barometer and the Chinese Lexicon Project, uh, but we also have a couple of other projects that I will briefly talk about. The China Wine Barometer is a three-year uh, project where we collect data uh, online uh, through an online panel provider in China every six months. We have already conducted two waves of data collection in March and October 2013. Uh, the first one focusing more on the on-premise sector, the second one focusing more on the off-premise and online sector. Uh, we are just about to launch the new wave of data collection, which is again going to be about the on-premise sector, and in this way we are able to monitor and track the changes in attitudes, preferences, perceptions, and behavior the Chinese consumers have about wine. The second project is what we call the Chinese Lexicon Project, and it's a project that started with a very simple question. 
if you've never seen a blueberry, you will never know, you, you will never say that the wine tastes of blueberry. So with this idea in mind, we um, went again to China, trying to understand what could be the equivalent descriptors of Western terminology, and trying to understand whether these descriptors could be potentially work better than uh, Western descriptors for Chinese consumers when they have to describe wine. Uh, I'm not going to disclose all the results about uh, neither the first or the second project because you will find uh, more news in the uh, Great and Wine News uh, of the GWRTC very soon. But today I want to give a brief overview of the uh, top of the line results that we got about them. Uh, the other two projects are. Um, the first one, as you can see, a project about wine education. We have um, a few thousands um, of Chinese and more in particular, and more in general Asian students in Australia. And we think that it could be very important that we're able to understand the best ways to educate them so that when they come back to their country, they're able to be brand ambassadors for Australian wines. And then we have a fourth project about Chinese tourists coming to Australia, because as you will see later on, the chances that these um, consumers are going to buy Australian wine overseas is quite high. So again, uh, the use of inbound tourists as a way to generate brand ambassadors can be very strategic for the Australian wine sector. Um, before we move on to today's agenda, um, we thought we'd ask a, a poll question, poll question. Uh, hopefully it's ready to come up, a little um, quantitative and qualitative research about exactly who is or is thinking of exporting into China. So we can encourage you all to uh, fill in the survey on the screen in front of you. Well, I perhaps throw it on Mando and say from sure. a some qualitative perspective, you're out there doing the research. What's your feel for who and how many Australians are exporting and, and, and is it growing? Um, well, certainly we're seeing that um, export is still partly dominated by bigger companies. Certainly those that were able to have also a critical mass of wine going to China certainly have an advantage compared to smaller wineries. But certainly we're seeing a trend also for small and medium wineries entering in the uh, Chinese market. Uh, certainly the chances for small and medium wineries to enter big retailers is certainly less but through more specialized wine shops. And I think, and uh, it will be interesting to hear comments from the audience about uh, the use of online um, retailers. That could be interesting to, to see how it can grow in the next few months. So what's that survey showing us there? Uh, we see the 57% has been exporting for over 12 months. Okay. So as we can see, there is a growing trend for exporting in this market. Hmm, a significant number. Okay, to today's agenda. Okay, so before we go on today's agenda, again, for those who were not here last time, I just would like to have a little bit of a reminder of what were the top of the line results that we got from the last uh, webinar. First of all, last time we said that the main motivations for Chinese consumers to drink wine are related to health reasons, relaxation, create a friendly atmosphere. In terms of the countries and the regions and great variety, certainly France dominates all the way. Uh, when we ask people what are the countries, regions and great varieties they know, most, for mo the majority of them, the, the answer is France, is Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, is Bordeaux. Um, half of the Chinese wine buyers are aware that there is a region in Australia in particular that makes wine, which is the Barossa Valley. And I hope I will not shock you too much in a few minutes when I'm going to show you the latest results about that. Um, one of the problems that I think we've seen so far is that Australia probably is not doing bad, but certainly doesn't do great at the same time. Because on the one side we have France that is really perceived as the leader producers of premium wines. And at the same time, we have China as probably the country which is more associated with a more commercial type of wine production. But Australia kind of doesn't stand up. It's kind of caught in the middle between other countries, such as Spain, such as Chile, uh, New Zealand, and the US. So doesn't have really any elements that we might say are really a weakness for Australia. But there is neither at the same time something that Australia really stands up. More on the Chinese lexicon project. 
Uh, what we presented last time was the first part of the project, which is which was a range of focus group and um, um, twelve focus groups that we run across three cities in China, forty eight people interviewed in total, where we try to come out with the main Chinese descriptors that Chinese consumers use to describe wine. Today I'm going to present the second stage of the project, which is about the quantitative statement of the elements that Chinese consumers use to describe the wine. In particular, um, if the slide moves on, I kind of go back. Okay, yes. So first of all, what I'm going to talk about today is what are the um, uh, what are Chinese consumers aware when it comes to wine? Uh, what is driving uh, retail choices for wine in China? Uh, what are the main off-premise and online um, players uh, and how they are perceived by Chinese consumers? And finally, uh, we will take a little break and we will talk about what are the main uh, descriptors that Chinese consumers use to describe wine. I can see that also I have a question. Uh, yes, I know Fonji Walker. I've been I've met her a few times actually, also in Beijing. Uh, both uh, and it happened. Um, very interesting person to talk to, and I have to say, quite fond of Australian wine. I hope she will not deny what I what I just said. Um, so let's move on on the first slide, which is looks familiar. It looks very familiar. Absolutely, it looks very familiar to what we had last time. So what you can see here are the percentages of consumers that says that they are aware of each of the countries of origin, grape variety, regions of origin, and then price point uh, at which they buy wine then in the retail sector. Uh, as you can see, the situation has not changed much in terms of countries. Still France dominates the, um, the market. Uh, almost everybody knows that France makes wine. There has been a little improvement for China, a little bit of decrease for Italy in terms of awareness. Australia, again, stays in the fourth place. 77% of people are aware that Australia as a country makes wine. Uh, to me, though, I have to say, a more interesting thing is the response that we're seeing about um, grape varieties. Again, Cabernet Sauvignon leads the way, uh, but it's interesting that immediately after Cabernet Sauvignon, we don't find other red grape varieties, but we find three white grape varieties, which are Sauvignon Blanc, that increased by 6% compared to March 2013, uh, so actually, these data have been collected in October 2013, so six months afterwards. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc went up a little bit, Chardonnay lost a little bit, and Riesling went up by 2%. So I think it's important here that we focus on the fact that certainly I'm not saying that we need to stop thinking about Shiraz or uh, Merlot or other great varieties for the Australian market, for the Chinese market, but certainly uh, we shouldn't underestimate the potentialities that white wines might have in the Chinese market, especially because when I'm going to talk um, in a few seconds about consumption occasions for wine of premise, certainly in a more informal type of environment, we can see a um, more frequent consumption of wine. In those occasions, some white wines can play well the role. Now, talking about regions of origins, uh, I hope you are not too much freaked out about the fact that you can see that Barossa lost 7% uh, compared to March 2013 in terms of awareness. An important point that I want to stress here is that um, we're not here to sell research. We're here to conduct research, possibly the best, the, the best way we can possibly can. And so we need to differentiate between what can be a fed and what can be a trend. We are going to collect data again, in, uh, as I said, in April 2014, and we are going to see whether these values are going to decrease again or are going to increase again. Uh, because it can also be a sampling issue that can uh, have generated these results. But certainly, that rings a bell. And that rings a bell about the fact that we should never stop promoting. Uh, moving away from wine, if you think about Coke, Coke, despite the fact it's the number one soft drink sold worldwide, 
It's a product that you find everywhere. You always find a vending machine around every corner because the fact that people are aware that Coke exists, it's the, it's the number one reason why they will buy that beverage when they feel thirsty. And we want to get to the same point. If we want Chinese consumers to buy wine and want to buy Australian wine, we need to be there when the Chinese consumers want our product. In terms of price points, we can see that most of the uh, wine uh, that is purchased at the retail, uh, in the retail sector is purchased at less than 200 renminbi per bottle, which is roughly about $30 per bottle. Uh, this is where most of the wine is consumed. So now, I would like to ask you another little question, if the poll question comes up, because I would like to ask you, what do you think are the main drivers for wine in the retail sector in China? Let's see if the question pops up. I put down, it does, I can't see, yes. So you can see I've given you eight choices. Um, we actually asked more, I made your life a little bit simpler, trying to focus on what we think are the most important. Uh, and I would like to have your opinion about what do you think is driving the choice of wine in the retail sector. Okay, we can see there's a few movements. Okay, something is leading the way. Um, we put down that label information, recommendation from a wine or critic, region, brand, recommendation friends and family, mm. uh, great variety, quality indicators, Interesting to watch that when I know what's about to come on the next slide. Yes, exactly. Well, um, well it's going to be, I think, a surprise for at least the 75% at the moment of, <laughs> <laughs> of people that have not picked that option. Interesting that uh, no one selected back label information. Not that I'm prompting. No. Mm. Let's see. See the Pretty much it. Yeah. We can move on. Okay, so from your polls, what we can see is that the quality indicators became the most important one. Has been, um, um, I think you've done it pretty well. Because yes, you're absolutely right. If I can stop uh, the poll and move on. Yes. So as you can see in this slide, the number one reason that um, pushes consumers to buy a product on shelf is the quality indicator. I mean, again, this is something that we're seeing across many markets. It's not certainly just about China. It's about how we as human beings think and how we know these things on shelf. The fact that you can put a label, uh, a medal, something that is able to attract consumer attention in store is certainly critical for the choice of the product um, in, in the store because in this way you're able to create a differentiation which is visual in the in which consumers buy wine. The second most important sector, which as you can see is very close to quality indicators, is grape variety. Uh, so going back to the point that we were saying before, about the fact that, okay, we have Cabernet Sauvignon that leads the way, but then we have a few other white grape varieties that tend to be important. My recommendation in this case is that we have to be brave. If we know that we have, and we are trying to um, push some grape varieties, and we want to communicate that the wine is made with those grape varieties, don't be shy. Communicate them. Use them in your label. Use them in your font. Um, a little bit more below, we can see vintage plays certainly a role. Our interpretation is certainly we have a French-driven approach probably to wine, where there is probably a little bit more importance about vintage in buying a product. Um, and after that, uh, you can see how much the country of origin is, is, is perceived to be more important compared to region of origin. As you can see, we have country of origin here with um, 84 uh, points and um, region of origin uh, a little bit more down there with 70, uh, with 70 points. Um, recommendations from family and friends score quite high. 
And interesting enough, you can see that it scores much higher than recommendation from wine critics on wine writers. Um, I think this is a very important point that we have to think about because probably in China, more than in other markets, we're seeing a change in the way in which consumers uh, talk between each other and the people that they tend to rely on. I'm not saying that we will stop having opinion leaders. I think opinion leaders are always going to be there. But the way in which opinion leaders are going to be formed is certainly going to be different from what we were used to be. Um, the use of Weibo, the use of WeChat, the use of social media in China is creating some sort of communities where maybe they will not have a direct impact on sales, but they're able to generate more awareness, they're able to make people talk about the product, so maybe the indirect effect that we have on this um, that we have about this for consumers can be quite high. So certainly um, uh, we need to spend probably more time in engaging with uh, consumers on these social platforms. Amanda, the number who, who listen to shop staff is very low. Yes. And uh, to me, the back label information also has no priority. Does that, I hesitate to suggest it, but does that suggest a continuing lack of sophistication that, that people are actually less interested in really knowing, they're just sure. interested in, in really obvious cues? Well, certainly. Um, I would say for the recommendation from, stop, from shop staff, um, one thing that we've noticed uh, is that we need probably to make a differentiation between what happens in hypermarkets and supermarkets compared to what happens in a specialized store. Because in an hypermarket and supermarket, you know that uh, brands who are going to hire staff that as soon as you approach the aisle, are going to push you towards a certain brand, a certain label. Uh, and that happens across a range of product categories. It's not just about wine, it's on toothpaste, um, other alcoholic beverages, and so on. Uh, so certainly there is a lack of um, trust about these people in a more hypermarket or supermarket level, but the situation can be different, as you will see in a few slides, when we talk about the independent stores, where actually all specialized stores, when people come and talk about the product. Uh, in relation to back label information, I think it's a good indication that we should take back. From what we're getting, certainly people might say that back label information is not an important. And I, I can see maybe no reasons to um, deny or don't believe about that. But again, I think there is a direct and indirect effect about that. Um, the same that we are able to have a back label that talks about wine and maybe talks about wine using the right words, as you will see in a while, can be a way, again, to generate knowledge to generate um, words that people can use to describe wine. So despite the fact that the direct impact on sales is not going to be huge, I think it's important that we generate more awareness about the words that people use or create a good a good link. The other interesting one, I guess, is the low response on promotional offer. Is that, oh, yes. is that genuine or is that just people saying what they think they should say in a survey? <laughs> well, I think everybody likes to play cool. I mean, nobody says that you will buy wine on promotion, but if there is a good deal, why not? Um, so I think it's important that we always take into account that this is a, a question as on intentions to buy and it would be great if we would also have data on real purchases that we could analyze so that we can back it up what people say, which is sometimes different to what people do. We've got a couple of questions here I noticed too. Natalie asks if variety uh, mm. is so high as an influence of France reflecting this in their labels, do they need to? Um, well, I think that certainly France plays a role. Um, no doubt that there is a, um, uh, a, a trend about uh, being fancy about France. So, but I can't see I can't see many many French labels apart from you know more the lowest tier ones that really push on the great variety. Mm -hmm. What we saw was certainly the fact that some French labels are pushing towards a fourth fifth tier of their label. I always make this example because it really impressed me, Chateau Lafitte, uh, where we said that everybody, even young guys, 20, 25 years old, were saying that they were buying Chateau Lafitte. It was not real Chateau Lafitte. It was from Chateau Lafitte, but it was like the fifth tier down in the, in the ranking. So yes, they were buying a Chateau Lafitte. It was not the real one, 
but it was just playing and was served the purpose of a nice, uh, of a nice dinner. So if you've got the name, which I think is what Natalie's asking the question, if you've got the name or, or you've got the, the, the French halo, then you possibly don't need to be put into variety as much as we and the other nations do. Yes, I, I think so. But, whoops, everything went on. I uh, <laughs> thought it was just that a... Okay, uh, so... Sorry, we had just a technical problem. The second yeah. question was James has asked if uh, these attributions change for different occasions. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Um, we have we 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 can certainly look into this information more, uh, but I can't give an answer right there on 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 this topic right for now. Okay. Um, now again. Now, if, if we talk though, I mean, going back to James' point about uh, frequency of wine consumption and look about occasions, certainly we can see that there is a weekly, uh, there is a weekly consumption of wine, in particular for two types of occasion, a relaxing drink at home and uh, with an informal meal at home. And we can certainly see that this, I think, relates more with the way in which Chinese consumers intend the way of even entertaining with people. Um, houses certainly are of a different size compared to Australia, there is more dependency of going out. So if you want to invite guests for dinner or if you want to celebrate a special occasion, you probably tend to do that more outside, not at home. But if you are alone or maybe just with your partner and you want to have a drink to relax, certainly you can see that the consumption of wine is almost done on a weekly basis. Um, by law, you cannot say, you cannot advertise the product as a healthy drink, as a healthy beverage, but as a matter of fact, especially with women, we've heard many times this thing that um, women will drink wine before going to bed because it's something that relaxes them, that probably makes the skin beautiful, uh, and, 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 and so on. So we can see that for this type of um, consumption, we can see uh, and more weekly consumption of the product. And those percentages then of 52 and 46 percent for an informal meal at home or a relaxing drink at home, that, that seems surprisingly high to me and I suspect we wouldn't have seen that even three or four years ago. Oh, but certainly not. I think that again, that's why I think it's very important that we're able to keep this tracking going on because at this stage this was the first time that we were collecting data on, on this sector and again, we're talking about 50% of people that consume wine on a weekly basis. It will be very interesting when we're going to collect it out again in October uh, 2014 to see how much these percentages are going to move, potential increase, I guess. Um, looking more into the average uh, price spent on a bottle of wine by occasion, maybe it's not a big wow factor well, to know and to see that when people buy wine for a special occasion uh, or when inviting guests, the uh, price point at which the people buy is certainly a bit higher, uh, between 200 and 500 in BB. Uh, but for a more normal consumption, we can see that most of the wine is consumed at about 200 in BB, which I said is, is $30. So I think this is a good thing that we should keep in mind when we export to China, think about what could be the price point for, at which we can um, let our product uh, leave the seller because we then need to consider taxes, we need to consider the margin of the distributor, potentially the retailer. Uh, so to get the product there at $30, how much should it cost uh, ex seller when it comes from Australia? And how are those figures there <coughs> compared to, say, on-premise? Well, certainly we can see a uh, decrease of probably about 50, 60 RMB compared to the on-premise sector, which I guess is going to be more uh, a factor of margin that uh, the restaurant would have on the uh, product that um, Chinese consumers buy wine for. Oh, moving on, uh, a little bit more of a um, crowded uh, slide, I would say. Um, in this slide, what you're going to see is the penetration that um, mm, Chinese consumers buy wine for different outlets. Penetration is a very important um, topic in marketing because penetration gives you the measure of people that would buy the product at least once in each of these retailers. So the fact that you can see here on the left, 
that item market has a penetration of 94%, it means that 94% of the people that we interview would buy wine in an item market at least once in the last 12 months. Um, you will see later on that item markets have a critical role for wine uh, purchasing in China, uh, in particular a couple of them, Walmart and Carrefour, uh, but certainly the kind of wines that you can buy there are probably, as we have in Australia, of the lower quality. Uh, to me, another interesting factor is the very high penetration that we see for wine shops and uh, specialized wine stores because uh, certainly the chances to be present in many wine shops can be complicated, but the relationship that Chinese consumers have with um, this type of stores is quite, um, it's quite peculiar, especially for uh, the more experienced wine consumers in China. But I would relate as well this information with the fact that 73% uh, buys at least once through a broker or distributor. Because one of the things that we see is that there are a few distributors, for example, Wine Republic, for example, Samagay, that actually own little chains of wine stores. Uh, which position themselves as specialized wine stores. So maybe if you cannot buy wine um, from the distributor, you will have the physical store, the brick and mortar of the distributor, of the broker, where you can buy wine. It was interesting when I was in Shanghai uh, to see that um, most of the specialized wine stores from brokers or distributors are physically located outside the main governmental buildings. Because in this way, when uh, um, uh, people from the government would come out, they could buy directly the wine from the suppliers. Now, certainly with austerity, things are going to change a little bit, but I think we're going to see again um, quite a few um, people buying wine from these specialized wine stores. Now, um, I have a question, is this study retail only? Yes, this part of the study is only retail. We have published the results about the on-premise sectors in March last year, and they are available on the um, Great Red Wine News at the GWRDC website. Now, the third thing I want to talk to you about is um, online wine retailing. Uh, certainly, it's a very interesting phenomenon because e-commerce in China increased by more than 70% in the last five years and is now having a um, turnaround of about $200 billion. Certainly, we can see an increase in uh, uh, B2C, business to consumer sales, and um, if you have to remember a date where you want to monitor your sales in China, remember the 11th of November. 11th of November in China is single day, and on single day, most of the wine retailers reach the top wine sales ever. I just got um, down a few data. Um, on that day, the overall turnaround for um, online retailing in China on that day was $2.1 billion, and Tmall, which is the equivalent of it's like a specialized Amazon, um, on that day only sell 500,000 bottles of wine. Yes, my wine, which is the, if you like, the U.S. venture capital of specialized online retailers in China, on that day sold 120,000 bottles of wine. So certainly, I think online retailing is something that is increasing a lot, and potentially, I think, compared to a big retailer such as Carrefour, Walmart, or other distributors, the chances to be promoted and to be there can be certainly higher. Now, I don't want to kill you with data. Uh, the only thing I wanted to show you here is that um, and you can take it home and use that if you can't fall asleep at night, uh, that weekly purchase behavior is kind of rare in any channel. So what I want to say, compared to the slides that we saw before, is that there is a weekly consumption of wine, but the locations at which consumers buy wine 
can be different on a weekly basis. So one week you can buy it at a, in an hypermarket, market, another week you can buy it at a wine store. So that's why we can see this sort of discrepancy between locations where people buy wine and the actual consumption of Asian. Well, before we move on, we did get a couple of other questions come through related to some early topics. Um, Matt says, their feedback says, foreign labels are a strong sign that it's an authentic import and not fake. Um, well, certainly trust is, is critical and in fact, um, uh, well, labels, I think, are, I think it, it's absolutely right. The fact that labels have sort of a, a stick attached to the original label could be a guarantee that the product is uh, original by status. But then, of course, you are, you are obliged, actually, by law, to have a label in Chinese. So potentially, yes, I'm not saying that we have to substitute the label, but to put something on top of it. But certainly, trust is fundamental. And in fact, for example, Tmall, which is, as I said, the Amazon equivalent in China, but only for specialized stores. One of the things that Chinese consumers love about that online retailers is the fact that it's safe that it kind of guarantees that the wine that goes through that retailer is not safe. It's 100% secure and real. Which would appear to be a big kick for online retail. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Neil asks, do the Chinese in general terms recognize specific vintages in various countries or just whether the whites are fresh or the reds mature? Uh, certainly when we talk more about, I would say, um, French wine in particular, they might recognize the vintage, but I think we are talking more about a very niche and small part of the population. So certainly there will be um, millionaires or very big connoisseurs about wine that are going to recognize the vintage as what it is, 1982 Bordeaux, let's say. But uh, I would say I would not probably focus very much on a general, uh, for the general population about vintage per se. And a, and a very general question, which we possibly take for granted, is wine consumption growing? Well, um, we all think from, the data, from the data from the forecast that we have from the wine economist, I'm um, not a wine economist, uh, uh, they're saying that wine consumption is going to increase, going to double. Um, I think they're saying by 2018, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, if I remember well. So at the moment we are about one liter per capita. We should go at 1.9 liter per capita in the next few years, which if you multiply by 1.5 billion people, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> You're about to move to consumer perceptions of wine retailers. I was just interested in the background to this component of the research and why. I guess I've never in any other market or situation seen that question asked, what does, yeah. how do consumers actually perceive them? That's obviously significant in the Chinese market. Yes, we think, we think it is because it's critical for a winery, we believe, that you find the right distributor, a right distributor that is going to place you in the right retailer. But sometimes we know that there is a bit of difference between what retailers and wineries think are the good location and what consumers think about these locations. And if we think that ultimately are going to be the consumers that buy our product, it's critical that we are able to understand what are the right places and what is the perception that people have about these places from a consumer perspective. So, a few other graphs and bars. What are we seeing here? You can see here three bars, a green one, a red one, and a blue one. What these three graphs shows you, the green one shows you the level of awareness that Chinese consumers have about all these, all these retailers that you see down here, which I'm going to talk about in a second. The second line shows you the um, people that say that they have visited the store. They might have bought in there or not, but at least they put a step in the store. The third line shows you people that have actually purchased wine in those stores. And going back to what I was saying before about penetration, this relationship between awareness and penetration is critical because again, if we know that people know about a store, if we know that people visited a store, it's fine. It ticks a couple of boxes, but if they're not actually bought wine in that store, uh, it's still useless. So looking at these conversion rates, 
um, you can see that probably the most important bar that we, need, that we need to focus on is the blue one down here, where we can see, as I said, the penetration, uh, which means the uh, number of people that have bought wine at least once in each of these retailers. Uh, because as you can see, on, just to comment briefly on the green bar, in terms of awareness, apart from a couple of stores, which are Ever Wine and Family Mart, um, all the other wine stores pretty much have the same level of awareness. So, let's look more in detail. Oops, sorry. Let's look more in detail about um, this slide. Walmart and Carrefour, which you can see here on the left, are certainly the stores where most of Chinese consumers have bought wine, wine at least once. About 60% of people said they've bought wine in these places at least once. Then we have a range of other stores, which are Liawa, Tesco, Lotus, or Shan, uh, which kind of play more or less on the same level. They also have a different type of retail structure, more related probably to supermarkets rather than hypermarkets. Um, but I would like also to focus the attention on Ole, as you can see here, and City Shop that you can see down here. Olé and CD Shop are two sort of premium um, supermarkets that tend to sell very much um, uh, imported products at a very high quality standard. And in these type of retailers, um, uh, I know that Australia is conducting some special promotions, way to position the product in, in those locations. So again, I think uh, for those who are listening now, um, I think, my guess, correct me if I'm wrong, you're going to be more like small and medium enterprises so, and wineries. So you're going to tell me how the hell can I enter in Walmart on Carrefour? And I probably, I would agree with you, it's almost impossible unless you have a big critical mass and probably you don't even want to get in there because the type of products that are sold there probably don't reflect the type of um, wine that you make. But I think that there are great opportunities on smaller but more premium oriented locations such as Olay, such as City Shop, um, or for example, as we can see here, Pudau Wines, which is the brick and mortar of a big distributor called Summergate, and Ever Wine, which is the brick and mortar of another big distributor called Wine Republic. These could be locations where Australian wines can position themselves in the retail sector uh, beyond, I would say, the on-premise sector and the online sectors where certainly uh, we can, uh, um, certainly we can uh, be positioned quite well. Uh, I have a question. Average prices in these supermarkets. Well, uh, I can see, I think, what we can see, I think it's something that reflects what I was saying before about um, average prices at which people buy the product. So certainly um, we might find some top of the line range um, uh, in some of these retailers, for example, I would say Pudau, or Everwines, Olé, uh, you can find certainly the Premier Cru, you can find the hundreds or thousand dollars wine, but at the end of the day, this is only for image building. If people don't buy wine at this price point, I think we should focus more on the price at which people buy the product, which I said is about 200 to 250 renminbi. Um, and as Sarah asked, how real is the austerity drive in China? You referred to it briefly um, as seen as a downturn in buying and sales of, of Australian wine in market. And I wonder also how that relates to the, the, the prices that they're, they're getting and asking at these various outlets. But look, I think the austerity, from what we're seeing, it's something that probably um, is going to eat distributors, I think, and really top of the line products. Um, I, I can't see more the middle class or the, um, the, the, the class that is coming out at the moment to really moving from saying buying a thousand dollar wine to a forty dollar wine. They would have not bought their wine anyway even before. So certainly at the more general level I think austerity is going to hit the market a little bit uh, but I think that if you're able to have products that are able to be consumed on a regular basis I think that we will be more protected to this problem than if we were selling a thousand dollar wine. And that can be a great thing for us. Fifty two percent of people we saw saying they exactly. drink conformity at home at least. Exactly. 
Um, moving on to wine distributors, again, you can see here that the percentages, they, well, first of all, people are less aware about wine distributors as a way to buy wine. It's interesting to see that in most of these wine distributors, you can buy wine. Even if you are an individual client, you don't need to be a business to buy wine from a distributor, and they're organizing themselves even in um, giving um, home deliveries, and that could be, I think, quite good for you know distribution of wine, but certainly percentages compared to before are much lower. Only about 20% of people buy wine from each of these retailers. Now, the third thing I want to talk about is the online market, because to me, there is certainly as I said, the one where Australian wines can play an important role and a market that is really booming in the last few years. Um, again, we can see here Timor and Taobao. Timor and Taobao are two online retailers which are part of a gigantic group called Alibaba. Alibaba is a uh, great structure that comprises a range of different online retailers at different levels. But as I said, Timor, sorry, I should say, um, I should say it different. Taobao is the real Amazon. So it's a business to consumer where people can buy and sell the product online, exactly as Amazon. In Timor, imagine that you have the power sellers that you have in Amazon translated in uh, Timor. So only if you have a real store and you want to sell online, you can be part of Timor. And so in these two retailers, we can see most of the wines that are sold. Um, there are retailers that um, Chinese consumers really, really trust. Um, and also, Timor and Taobao are Chinese owned. Different from Yes My Wine, which is a US venture capital that invested in this website and is now uh, probably the number one um, for, for some type of premium products, the number one retailers of wine in China. Uh, they have an average of about 15, I think, thousand bottles sold per day. And as I said before, on some days it can pick up to uh, 120,000 bottles per day. Um, I would skip a few of the others because I think um, there is not much to comment about, but I would like to focus on these small retailers here. It's called Mint Sellers. Uh, this is a very small retailer, but interesting if you want to position yourself as a premium wine, uh, uh, as a premium wine product because Mint Sellers is a restaurant chain and a club that is now putting up its online website. And in a few years, Mint Sellers became the number one distributors of Dom Perignon in Asia. So you can see that if you want to position, probably not as a Dom Perignon, but if you want to position yourself as a top wine retailer, uh, maybe a, a, a nice way would be to talk with the guys at, um, at Mint Sellers. Now, the last slide before we take a little break can be a bit messy, I apologize for that, but what this slide shows you is the relationship between different retailers that you can see here, Walmart, Carrefour, Oshan, Tesco, and some elements, which are all the green ones, which um, you can see better in the um, final report about the China Wine Barometer Wave 2 that we're going to release very soon, uh, which are all, as I said, all these elements that kind of relate to the different, um, uh, to the different retailers. Why have created such a slide and why we have conducted this type of analysis? Um, we have done that because we wanted to compare you can see here this group three, which is what we consider the independent local wine store. Let's say the store that every Chinese consumer might have around the corner where they can buy wine on a more regular basis. Uh, as you can see here, um, the only two elements that are really important for a wine, an independent wine store, are staff. If you're able to have the staff in these locations that is able to talk about the product, that it could be friendly, that is able to describe wines, that could be critical for your product to be sold in those locations. So what I'm saying is that in thinking about 
exporting wine in China, if you want to deal with independent retailers, um, it requires probably a little bit more of effort of not just selling the product, but being sure that while promoting certainly other wines, uh, they're able to put Australian wines in the list of the wines that they want to talk about and that they want to communicate. Um, for the rest, um, given time, I will not spend too much time, but um, as I said, we have all the data and we will uh, release them soon in the um, final report of the China Wine Barometer. Now, uh, I would like to take two minutes break before we move on to the Chinese Lexicon project. Uh, and I would like to ask you a question and I would like um, all of you to write down notes on your text box on the left. Um, and the question is the following. Think about your top selling wine. Uh, be a red wine, a white wine, a sparkling, the third, whatever is your selling, is your number one um, top selling wine. If you have to describe this wine to a Chinese consumer, what would you say about the wine? What would you say about how it tastes, how it feels? Um, so very simple as that. If you can write it down, I would like to hear your comments before I move on to the second stage of the research. Maybe we can watch, we can uh, watch their comments coming up in the box. Perhaps if we uh, follow on with the pres continue with the presentation, we'll pick it up as we go. Sure. We're just running out of time. I'm keen okay. to hear about the, the, the words the Chinese use. Okay. So, should I just move on? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, this is, as I said, the second part of the research that um, uh, the, results of, the results of the first part is that we presented in March, um, sorry, in November uh, 2013. Uh, in the second stage, we move into the quant stage. So what we've done was to conduct three um, uh, center location tests in China, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou, and Chengdu, with about 180 people actually in each city. And what we've done was let them try a range of wines, a range of wines that have been sensory characterized by um, the Australian Wine Research Institute so that we could comprise the range of wines that uh, we export more often in Australia. We have five whites, four red, uh, sorry, five reds, four whites, three sparkling, and two dessert wines. And um, we let them try these wines. We ask them traditional questions about like ability, willingness to buy, and so on. And then we gave them a, re a range of items that we asked them to, to take so that they were able to tell us from a consumer perspective what are the descriptors that Chinese consumers use to describe wine. Uh, we split the sample into groups, Chinese, the, the one that received sort of the Chinese version and the one that received the Western version. and. Uh, as I said, today I'm just going to present top of line results because we're going to be uh, coming to the regions and present those results more in detail. Um, so from a more general perspective, we can see that the words that come out more often to describe wine are astringent, sour, mellow, lingering, fruity, smooth. Uh, I think it's very important to, to focus on these elements because astringent in particular is translated in Chinese with the word se. So this word se is what um, Chinese consumers associate with the tannin that you get from a tea. That, that kind of astringency that you have when drinking tea is what is referred to when, we, uh, when they try wine. Sour and mellow can be sort of like two aspects of, if you like, the same side. We've been doing a lot of wine tasting of Chinese wine in, in China. And certainly what we're, what we're seeing, especially with Cabernet Sauvignon, is that we're having wines that tend to be quite, as I said, quite mellow, quite smooth in mouth uh, when you start drinking them. And then all of a sudden you have this uh, kind of like tannin bomb that comes afterwards and then tend to continue later on. Completely different way of thinking about wine that we have in Australia. And in fact, I mean, my personal opinion was they were not probably one of my best. Those that to me are quite acceptable are certainly those where Australian winemakers or French winemakers intervened and helped Chinese consumers to, um, to get the product right. Um, so, so as I said, these are the main descriptors that Chinese consumers use in terms of generic 
descriptors. If we move on, uh, you can see these lines where we have compared the frequency at which specific descriptors are mentioned by um, Chinese consumers. So you can see here that we have a range of descriptors which are, you say, Yang Mei, which we hypothesize is the equivalent of the strawberry flavor, dry Chinese authors, which we hypothesize is the uh, equivalent of blackberry preserve, dry berry, strawberry preserve, and so on and so on. Um, I'm not going to tell you yet uh, if this equivalence is old, um, because again, this is part of another, of another seminar, but it's interesting to see that Chinese consumers, as we thought, do not necessarily use Western terminology to describe wine. If you're more familiar in your experience with a young May rather than a strawberry, you might say that the wine tastes more of a strawberry, even though they might have the same, uh, the same taste, because it's part of the experience that you have with the product that brings you to talk about the product more often. And to me, the other interesting thing is that the Chinese terms tend to be used more often when we talk about fruits. Um, and something that is more on the sweet side of the, of the descriptors. When it comes to other elements, such as, as you can see here, cooked meat, bacon, green bell peppers, certainly the use of probably Western descriptors tend to be, um, tend to be more, uh, uh, more critical. Um, and probably this is related to the experience that Chinese consumer had more um, with wine and the way in which they approach uh, the product um, later on. Um, if we go on the white wines, again you can see here that some terminologies like lemon, grapefruit, citrus fruit, uh, peach, lychee, gooseberry tend to be selected more often in the western versions, but there are others like Asian pear, pandan leaf and um, often that's it. Uh, they tend to be um, used more often in their Chinese version. So I think the main takeout point that I want to have from this slide is that I'm not saying and we're not saying that we need to completely change the use of terminology uh, and the words that we use to describe our wines. But for some of them, as we've seen here, in particular before on the um, strawberry, uh, blackberry, blueberry, and so on, certainly it might, it can be interesting, it can be a great thing to do to use some of these Chinese versions to talk about the product and describe the product in the Chinese market. Um, so, to conclude, I will just go a few slides later on. Um, I think it's, we need to continue our marketing activity in China to make sure that Chinese consumers increase their awareness of Australian wines in their market, otherwise we will always fall behind compared to other countries such as France. Um, don't be shy, use your quality indicators, medals, awards, um, great variety to communicate wine, especially in the retail sector. Um, it's important to know penetration and purchase frequency that Chinese consumers have because if we want our brand to grow, we certainly need to increase more penetration rather than purchase frequency. We need to have more buyers rather than trying to sell more to the existing ones. Um, um, and as I said below, awareness is one thing when we talk about retailers, but it's also important to know where people actually buy um, the product. Um, and knowing therefore brick and mortar and the retailers, how they are categorized, how people perceive them could be better for wineries to align the location with the image that um, wineries want to create in the Chinese market. Um, there is an opportunity to use, the, as I said, these Chinese words to assist um, the product in the Chinese market and to really show that Australia, every country, is able to be the country that more than others is consumer driven, trying to make the product more easy to buy for the um, export market. Um, so as a consequence, and this is going to be also part of another presentation that we're going to do soon, uh, we should run and we might run wine education programs that incorporate the words that we've used in this study so that we are able to generate a more familiar environment for Chinese consumers there. Um, and yes, improve the product 
footprint in, uh, in the on-premise, off-premise and online channels uh, should be a sort of like a wider type of approach that we should try to convey more in this amazing but complicated market. Thank you. Amanda, thank you. Um, I had plenty of questions that come out of your conclusions, but I'm afraid we run out of time. We'll certainly be collating the responses that people put forward uh, to, your, to your questions uh, at the start of this section. Um, we'll possibly uh, see what we can read from them and get back to people who participated sure. with some kind of feedback. Um, again, a very full session. I hope people found it of use. Um, I've just got a couple of little housekeeping uh, things to do before we go. The first is to let you know that Amanda and two of his colleagues will be doing China Insight workshops uh, in the Barossa, McLaren Vale and Mornington Peninsula quite soon. You can see the dates uh, on the screen there. Um, to find out more information or to register, go to the GWIDC website. The second plug is for um, our next webinar, which will be on Tuesday the 29th of April. This is with uh, Finlayson's on the thorny issue of wine equalisation tax. We'll be asking some very specific questions of two of their tax expert partners. Um, so if WET is something to concern you, please, uh, uh, seminar, uh, this webinar is free for WCA members, I think $45 for others. Registration will open later this week, but you can again find details on the Wine Communicators website. Um, thirdly, a reminder for people in Adelaide and Perth that they can still get into our uh, annual lecture series with uh, Paul Mabray, which was a a big hit in Sydney. Uh, it's on in Melbourne tonight. Um, unfortunately, I think that's sold out. All tickets are no longer available. But uh, Adelaide on Thursday and Perth on Friday. Bookings and details on the Wine Communicators website. And finally, as always, um, to thank you for joining us. Um, to ask if you could take a second to complete the exit survey that should come up on the screen as soon as I stop talking. To let you know that if you would like more information about consumer insights and the latest research results from the GWRDC, uh, join up to Great and Wine News. Again, go to the GWRDC website. And of course, we always encourage people to become members of Wine Communicators. You get access to all of our past web webinars, discounted tickets to events, media bites, and a lot more. We're a, a growing organisation, very much trying to be the communications conduit for this industry. So. Um, Thanks again for joining us. I hope to see you or hear you or speak to you all at our next webinar. Thanks very much.